মনোয়ার মনে একটু স্টপ করে রাখো তো স্যার এর ইন্ট্রোডাক্টরি কথা বলি তারপর আমি শুরু করব আসসালামু আলাইকুম হ্যাঁ জামিল ভাই চলে আসছে সাউন্ড কি জানি ভাই বলো স্যার প্লিজ जेंटलम we are going to start our today's session this is a basic and beyond today we have got three sessions first one this is in sinus node dysfunction it will be talked by dr akm manwar ali sir it will be followed by interesting issues by dr fikamit sir and then this is the other week as is well we have got our um, course directors professor amatar ali sir and professor abdul wadud sir we have got our international advisor uh, dr rafiq ahmed sir and other faculties dr abdullah jamil professor mohsin hussein uh, professor choudhry hasan hasan sir uh, may i request abdul wadud sir to say few words about today's session professor abdul wadud sir please assalam alaikum and a very good evening to everybody uh, we are eagerly awaiting for the lecture that will be delivered by dr monwar i, I would want to say few words about monwar uh, he has been my student since third year and you know as a student he was so studious and so eager to learn i have to admonish him please do not read so much enjoy a bit of life but i think he has got pleasure in life by learning more and more about cardiology is beautiful presentations in different subjects so that uh, it has become uh, a norm that whenever you want to know something definitive about something just ask monwar monwar do you know what is what you will get the answer very shortly so this is monwar so we hope we'll be getting a very good lecture from him Firoz, you can proceed. Sir, uh, Professor Atar Ali, sir, you want to say something, sir? Professor Atar Ali, sir, few words about today's session. ECG in sinus node dysfunction. Uh, uh, good uh, evening, everybody. And actually, I would uh, like to welcome everyone, particularly uh, Professor Rupi Ahmed, sir, uh, Hafiz Bhai from USA. Abdul Al Jamil Huru was from Nepal, and actually this is Dr. Mono. Or actually, I think he does not need any introduction, and I have actually no words to describe Mono or what he is. He is such a type of talent, boy, and such a type of good type of lecturer and the clinician. He has already crossed the boundary and has actually gained his reputation from uh, internationally. So this is actually Mono. We are waiting to hear the lecture from Dr. Monwar. We are lucky that Monwar, Monwar has actually agreed to uh, talk on this, on this particular session. So, this is Dr. Monwar. Thank you, uh, sir. I like to say something, Firoz, yes. about Monwar. He is Dr. one Kamil. of my favorite students. I taught them 
uh, while they were in uh, fifth, fifth year student MBBS in Dhaka Medical College. And uh, I was in responsible teaching them X-rays and ECGs. So uh, from that onward, I know him. He's a so keen learner and a very good teacher as well now. I wish best for him. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request Dr. A.K.M. Monwar Listam uh, to uh, share his presentation and uh, give a talk on ECG in sinus node dysfunction. Dr. A.K.M. Monwar Listam is working as Associate Professor of Cardiology and ICBD. He is a graduate from Dhaka Medical College and he later had his fellowship in uh, medicine, FCBS in medicine and MD in cardiology. And we worked together for long years in NICBD to there, in NICBD. Uh, Dr. Manwar, please. Thank you, Firoz Bhai. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everybody. Uh, I am happy that uh, all many of my teachers have uttered so high sounds regarding me. And uh, Actually, today I am very hesitant to deliver a lecture on ECG in sinus node dysfunction. This is actually a topic which throughout my academic life I feared. And uh, I have bad luck that this is in my uh, part that I have to say something regarding sinus node dysfunction. Let us start. Today, I will at first give an overview of the sinus node dysfunction. This is because that uh, in our postgraduate, postgraduate courses and even in our practical life, this topic is to some extent less discussed and sometimes we may not have right idea regarding this entity in uh, cardiology. After this, I will go to my main presentation on the ECG uh, features of sinus node dysfunction. I will try to cover mainly the ECG features, excluding the treatment of this entity. Uh, most of the examples shown here have been collected by me over several years. So I will try to give a good number of examples, what, what I have encountered in my professional life. Let us start. What is sick sinus syndrome? One thing that should be clear that this is a syndrome, not a single thing. So this is a syndrome. We know that syndrome is a combination of uh, features. And this is also true for sinus node dysfunction. This is characterized by abnormal sinus node functioning with resultant bradycardia and organ hypoperfusion. Bradycardia is the essential criterion. Tachycardia may be present, but this is optional. This is not compulsory. Organ hypoperfusion is another essential criterion. Otherwise, the definition uh, or the diagnosis of sinus node dysfunction will not be met. And what are the common manifestations of organ hypoperfusion? The common manifestations are uh, by the CNS symptoms like pre and synco, but there may be other constellation of features I will discuss later on. Actually, sinus node dysfunction may be a misnomer. This entity does not confine itself to sinus node itself. It extends beyond the sinus node to cover the other parts of the conduction system of the heart, even in the infrahesian part of the conduction system. What are the actual causes of sinus node dysfunction? The causes may be classified broad, broadly into two categories. One is intrinsic and another one is extrinsic. Among the intrinsic causes, probably the most important one is degenerative fibrosis. And there may be a role of amyloidosis, which is being recognized increasingly in day by day. Among the extrinsic causes, there are some well-known entities like obstructive sleep apnea, which is getting more and more attention nowadays. And certainly there are roles of some drugs and toxins and also this electrolytemia. 
Now, what are the common arrhythmias that can be encountered in sinus node dysfunction? As I have already mentioned that presence of bradyarrhythmias is a must. And among the bradyarrhythmias, some are common like sinus bradycardia, sinoatrial exit block, which may be first degree, second degree, or third degree, sinus pauses and arrests, and also sometimes ectopic atrial bradycardia that may also be present in case of sinus node dysfunction. Among the tachyarrhythmias, atrial fibrillation and flutter are the commonest, but also sometimes we can encounter atrial tachycardia, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. And another very characteristic feature of uh, uh, sinus node dysfunction that is often encountered is the tachybrady syndrome, which I will discuss later on. What are the common clinical presentations? This disease has got an unique feature that it may remain asymptomatic for many years before diagnosis. And sometimes it may be only mildly symptomatic. Symptoms are predominantly related to decreased cardiac output, like CNS symptoms, as manifested by syncope, presyncope, dizziness, vertigo. And also another important manifestations may be effort intolerance, angina, heart failure. So all these features may actually uh, underlie the or may be accompanied in case of sinus node dysfunction. 50% patients of sinus node dysfunction may actually present with syncope or presyncope. How can you diagnose sick sinus syndrome or the sinus node dysfunction? Sick sinus syndrome and sinus node dysfunction are synonymous. Actually, the favorite term is sinus node dysfunction. So I will use this term throughout my presentation. I have already mentioned that sinus node dysfunction is a syndrome, so there are combination of features. Unfortunately, this disease has got no standardized criteria and also it lacks any single diagnostic test. But like many other conditions in medicine, it has got important role for history and history gives initial clues actually. It is diagnosed by correlating symptoms of end organ hypoperfusion with occurrence of bradycardia with or without accompanying tachycardia. So this is a very important uh, uh, feature that uh, combination of symptoms and also the presence of bradyarrhythmia should be present. Symptoms may be variable, intermittent, and difficult to associate with ECG changes. And this is already known by us whenever we encounter the patients in our clinical life. ECG abnormalities and clinical symptoms must be present, as I have already mentioned. Mind it, sinus pauses, even if more than three seconds, it not, is not diagnostic in absence of symptoms. Sinus node dysfunction has got some important differential diagnosis, like carotid sinus hypersensitivity, neurocardiogenic syncope, especially the freedom, which one is the cardio inhibitory, and also sometimes physiologic bradycardia, especially encountered in highly conditioned athletes, may be confused with six and a syndrome. What are the tests that may aid in our diagnosis? Unfortunately, there is no single test that can uh, in, in entertain or refute the diagnosis of sinus node dysfunction. However, some common and less common tests may actually help in our day-to-day -day life. The bread and butter for the cardiologists is the 12 bleed ECG. Unfortunately, this 12 bleed ECG has got low yield in case of diagnosing six sinus syndrome. Ambulatory ECGs in the form of halter ECG, event monitor, implantable loop recorders have got very important role when especially 12 bleed ECGs does not help. Exercise ECG has got limited role. I will discuss later on. There may be some role of electrophysiological study, but this has got low sensitivity and of uncertain specificity. Other tests sometimes may help, like pharmacological tests and carotid sinus messages with ECG monitoring, uh, and it can yield sinoatrial positive of more than three seconds, but this is not diagnostic. 
let us discuss the role of 12 bleed ECG, which is the most versatile tool for the diagnosis of many arrhythmias. As I have already mentioned that it has got low sensitivity and only occasionally helpful. Severe sinus bradycardia, especially if heart rate is less than 40 beats per minute, with episodes of sinoatrial arrest, sinoatrial exit block, and slow atrioventricular escape rhythm is sufficient evidence to make the diagnosis. But this is very easy to say, but very difficult and very rare to encounter in day-to-day -day life. Other suggestive ECG features that should be kept in mind is that if we are lucky enough to encounter atrial fibrillation with very slow ventricular rate, that may actually indicate presence of sinus node dysfunction. Another entity is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia terminating in long pause. So a tachycardia that suddenly stops and this is followed by a long pause, always think of presence of sinus node dysfunction. Let us discuss briefly the role of exercise ECG. Uh, this has got very limited role, only occasionally helpful. I think you have by this time heard of chronotropic incompetence. And here, there may be a role of exercise ECG to diagnose chronotropic incompetence in a patient with sick sinus syndrome. Actually, chronotropic incompetence may be a feature of sinus node dysfunction. What is chronotropic incompetence? Unfortunately, there is no uniform definition or no uniform criteria for the diagnosis of chronotropic incompetence. Usually, it is diagnosed by means of ETT or TMT, and uh, uh, it is often diagnosed when a patient on treadmill exercise fails to reach either 85% or 80% or sometimes 70% of the ACE predicted maximal heart rate. We all know that the simple equation for the calculation of maximal heart rate for a person is 220 minus age for males and 220 minus age minus 10 for females. So if the patient cannot achieve the target heart rate uh, in simple language, this may indicate chronotropic incompetence in absence of drugs like beta blockers or rate limiting calcium channel blockers. In sinus node dysfunction, even maximal exercise capacity may result in less than 20% increase in the sinus rate. And this may give a clue for the presence of chronotropic incompetence, which is a feature of sinus node dysfunction. Uh, now I am going to discuss the uh, main tool for the diagnosis of Six sinus syndrome, that is ambulatory ECG, usually used for confirmation of the diagnosis. And the expected findings in case of ambulatory ECGs are loss of normal diurnal variation in sinus rates. If you encounter a patient that is having the fixed rate in most of the times of the day and night, probably this is due to loss of diurnal variation, and you may actually deal with the case of sinus node dysfunction. Another common entity, as we already know that, there may be bradyarrhythmias in the form of sinus bradyarrhythmia, less than 40 beats per minute, sinoatrial arrest, sinoatrial exit block, slow atrioventricular escape rhythms. Presence of slow atrioventricular escape rhythms may always indicate presence of sick sinus syndrome. Tachyarrhythmias may be encountered, and especially the supraventricular tachycardias. Diagnosis needs clear correlation between symptoms and period of bradyarrhythmias. I am giving much emphasis on this sentence that you have to be sure that diagnosis needs clear correlation between symptoms and periods of bradyarrhythmia. Whatever bradyarrhythmia we encounter, if this is not correlated with clinical presentation, you are not probably dealing with six and a syndrome. 24-hour halter monitoring is the usual initial choice because of its availability and simplicity, and it may be repeated once or twice. And if there is still uncertainty regarding the diagnosis and the suspicion is strong, then you can adopt other modalities of ambulatory ECG monitoring like event recorder or implantable loop recorder 
uh, uh, this can be sometimes helpful. We all know that mainly three types of ambulatory ECG monitoring systems are available, Halter monitor, event recorder, implantable loop recorders, and the sensitivity and specificity of these tools mainly depend on the frequency of the arrhythmias uh, occurring in the patient with suspected sinus node dysfunction. I'm not going into details of this thing because this is not the main the focus of my today's presentation. Uh, these are the commonly used rhythm monitors, uh, halter monitor, event recorder, implantable loop recorders, and another one is geopaths. Sometimes, whenever we are encountering bradyarrhythmias, uh, this may even be of no diagnostic uh, for the diagnosis of sick sinus syndrome. In other words, sometimes several types of bradyarrhythmias may even be seen in case of absolutely healthy persons. If we look for a study uh, here, we see that sinus pauses even more than two seconds may be present in up to 10% of the healthy persons. Sinus bradycardia even less than 40 beats per minute may be uh, encountered in up to one fourth of the healthy persons. First degree heavy block, even winky back phenomenon may be present in uh, a fraction of healthy individuals. So you have to keep this in mind whenever you are making the diagnosis of six sinus syndrome and you are going to think of implanting a pacemaker in a person. Now, I will say a few words regarding an obsolete test that is pharmacological tests for the diagnosis of sinus node dysfunction. Usually these are not uh, done today. And uh, I am talking about atropine and isoprenaline. The main theme is that whenever atropine or isoprenaline is used intravenously, the expected result is increase in sinus rate. But if we encounter a patient with sinus node dysfunction, and if we infuse atropine or isoprenaline, there is uh, less than expected increase in sinus node because of the unhealthy or sick sinus node. This is the uh, uh, phenomenon that we encounter in a patient with sinus node dysfunction, but these tests are not uh, uh, done regularly nowadays. Another very important test is electrophysiological study. We know that this is the bread, of but bread and butter for the electrophysiologists. But unfortunately, for the diagnosis of sinus node dysfunction, this may not be a, a, a gold standard test because of its relatively low sensitivity and uncertain specificity. The commonly observed parameters in case of uh, electrophysiological study in a suspected patient with sinus node dysfunction are mainly two. One is sinus node recovery time, and another one is sinoatrial conduction time. I will expect more comments from our teachers who are specialized in electrophysiology. Now, with this background, I am going to my main presentations. I think this will also be a short one, and you will enjoy it. One dictum I am going to uh, utter that normal ECG does not exclude the diagnosis of sinus node dysfunction. You have to keep this in your mind. Normal sinus rhythm with sinus arrhythmia, uh, you sometimes encounter in your clinical practice, PP intervals vary by more than 0.16 seconds. And this is often uh, uh, related to the respiratory cycles. Another entity, sinus bradycardia. I have already mentioned that sinus bradycardia may even be encountered in a normal person, and this is commonly encountered, but sometimes it may be secondary to some sorts of diseases and drugs and electrolytes. But in case of sinus node dysfunction, you can sometimes encounter only sinus bradycardia. And what are the clues that it is due to sinus node dysfunction? There are no absolute values below which you will say that you are encountering sinus node dysfunction, but certainly there are some clues. Whenever we encounter a patient with sinus bradycardia, and this sinus bradycardia is marked, what is marked? Maybe less than 40 beats per minute, or it may be inappropriate. What is inappropriate? 
inappropriate are the situations whenever we expect rise of ventricular rate, but we are not uh, getting the expected ventricular rate, like less than 50 beats per minute ventricular rate during exercise or fever. We all know that ventricular rate rises along with rise of temperature. So if in practical life, we do not get such sorts of expected response in exercise or fever, probably we are dealing with inappropriate bradycardia. And another characteristic feature is loss of diurnal variation. So sinus bradycardia, though often physiological, but sometimes this may be pathological. And these are the clues for pathological sinus bradycardia. Sinus bradycardia sometimes may look a bit different in case of uh, resting tubular DCG, as is here. Here you are, in, uh, you are seeing a case of sinus bradycardia with white QRS complex that is due to bundle branch block. Now, a few words regarding sinuatrial exit blocks. The cardinal features in ECG are the absence of P waves and the presence of pauses. The pauses are having duration exactly multiple of basic PP intervals. Like second degree AV blocks, these sinuatrial exit blocks may be of first degree, second degree, or third degree. First degree sinuatrial blocks, in case of first degree sinuatrial blocks, all the P waves will be conducted, but the time will be more. So there will be delayed conduction of the P waves. It cannot be diagnosed by ECG. ECG looks like sinus rhythm. Second degree sinuatrial blocks, some sinus impulses fail to conduct and some become successful to conduct. And like the counterpart in AV node, it has got two types. One is type one or winky back phenomenon, and another one is type two. The last one, and the, probably the most severe one, is the third degree sinuatrial block. Uh, unfortunately, this entity cannot be differentiated uh, from the sinus pauses in case of 12 bleed ECG. ECG looks like sinus pause. Let us have the example of a, a real world patient. This patient is a middle-aged man who presented with dizziness. And here is the uh, part of the halter monitor record of this patient. And here you are seeing that just uh, repeated twist to one essay blocks. If you are looking, just the PP intervals are exactly half of this pause. So this is an example of twist to one sinuatrial exit block. Sinuatrial exit block, I have already mentioned that there are three types. I am telling about second degree type one, though this may not be uh, very essential to make the diagnosis, but you may have some knowledge regarding the ECG features. Look at this rhythm strip. Here the P waves are of uniform morphology and the axis is also normal, though for the determination of axis, other leads are also needed. There is progress progressive shortening of PP interval. Look at this, this is PP interval. And here the PP interval is a bit uh, shorter than the, this one. And here the PP interval even shorter. And here there is a drop P wave. And also the PR interval is constant. PP pause is less than just twice the preceding uh, PP interval. So and there is regular repetition of this cycle. This is an example of type one sinuatrial block, exit block, that is the winky back phenomenon. And here, this is the type two, sorry, uh, there is a mistake, type two. Type two, what are the features of type two? Again, the P waves should have the normal morphology and the PR interval is fixed. PP interval is also constant, but there are uh, 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 regular dropping of the P waves in places like here, like here. So look at this, the, the PP pause, PP interval in case of the pause is just twice the preceding PP interval. Two times, it may be three times or even more. And this is an example of type two sinuatrial exit block. Now, I'm going to say a few words regarding sinus pause or sinus arrest. 
what are the differences between the two terminologies? The differences are uh, just uh, uh, very small. Sinus pause, like here, the sinus pause looks like exit block, but here the PP interval is having no uh, a half or multiple or triple uh, uh, relationship with the preceding PP intervals. This is the sinus pause. Whenever the sinus pause is a very long one, this is sometimes called sinus pause. Otherwise, this uh, sinus arrest, this is called sinus arrest. So sinus pause, whenever long, relatively long, sometimes may be called sinus arrest. But the distinction is relative, not any absolute. Uh, I, I am very lucky that just two or three days ago, whenever I was in my chamber, I encountered this ECG. This, is, this belonged to a 75-year-old male, and here, just a 12-lead ECG has presented with a sinus pause here. Look at this. But this is very un, uh, unusual to demonstrate sinus pause in a resting 12-lead ECG during the course of a snapshot of time. Now, a few words regarding escape rhythms. Escape rhythms, look at this. This is the rhythm strip. And here, we are seeing some sorts of supraventricular rhythm, regular supraventricular rhythm, maybe sinus beat, sinus rhythm. And this sinus rhythm is followed by a pause and this pause is followed by a new rhythm. New rhythm, certainly this is a regular rhythm. Apparently, it looks like sinus rhythm. But if you look carefully, the P wave here and the P wave here are not similar, number one. But the QRS complexes are absolutely similar, like here and here. And, and also the rate the rate in the sinus rhythm here and the sinus and the rate here are not same. So we are dealing with a case of atrial escape rhythm. What are the special features of atrial escape rhythms encountered in a case of uh, sinus node dysfunction? Usually, the rate of the atrial escape rhythm is low. So this is a very important feature. The inherent rate of atrial escape rhythm is 60 to 80 bits per minute. There may be junctional escape rhythm, as is here. The sinus rhythm is followed by a pause, and the sinus node has failed to uh, uh, fire subsequently, and the patient should not let die. And for this region, the nature has given a protection by uh, uh, giving a new uh, responsibility to the AV node. So the AV node tends to take over the charge of making uh, rhythms, that is beats. So this is a case of sinus junctional escape rhythm. The rhythm is slower than the preceding sinus rhythm, and it lacks any P wave. And also, the QRS complexes are normal looking. So this is an example of junctional escape. This may be a feature of sinus node dysfunction. In case of sinus, in case of junctional escape rhythm, P wave may or may not be visible. The P wave is usually buried within the QRS complexes, but sometimes the P wave may be preceded by QRS complex, or sometimes it may be followed by the QRS complex. So we may encounter junctional escape rhythm in a patient with uh, sinus node dysfunction. Look at this. This is an example of junctional escape. Here we are seeing that there is a uh, just episodes of supraventricular tachycardia, and this is followed by a long pause, followed by a same supraventricular beat, and then again a pause, and this pause is followed by appearance of a new pacemaker in the AV node, and there is regular but slow junctional escape rhythm. Again, the junctional escape rhythm has been followed by the return of the supraventricular, rapid supraventricular rhythm here. So these sorts of arrhythmias are very suggestive of sick sinus syndrome or sinus node dysfunction, unless proved otherwise. 
let us have a real world experience. This is the story of a 40 year old man with syncope. Here, whenever we got the altar monitor report of this patient, we saw that this patient is having uh, a repeated long pauses. And here, the long pause is followed by appearance of a normal looking QRS complexes with very slow rate. And look at this, there is no P waves and apparently the rhythm is regular. So this is a case of junctional escape, which is preceded by significant long pause. So these types of arrhythmias are commonly encountered in case of sinus node dysfunction. Now I am going to talk about ventricular escape. Sometimes sinus node dysfunction, especially if accompanied by disease involving the other parts of the supraventricular territory, even the AV node, they may fail to fire. And ultimately, the responsibility may entail on the ventricle, as is the case here. This sinus rhythm, regular sinus rhythm, is followed by a pause. And then there is a broad, regular broad rhythm in the form of ventricular escape. Look at this. There is no P wave. Apparently, it looks like presence of complete AV block. But if we, are, if we are going to distinguish between the two entities, in case of complete AV block, there will be P waves also. And the P wave rate and the QRS complex rates will be entirely different, and there will be telltale signs of or evidence of AV dissociation. But here, in case of ventricular escape observed in a patient with severe sinus node dysfunction, there will be no P wave because the sinus node has failed to fire and the responsibility has been taken over by the ventricle. So this is an example of ventricular escape rhythm, which is slow, maybe, uh, uh, and uh, maybe it may not be dependable. And this may be encountered in a patient with extensive sinus node dysfunction. Uh, in the other, part, part, other side of the coin, we can encounter different types of tachyarrhythmias. As is the case here, this is sinus tachycardia. We all know this, and this is a very common phenomenon. Sometimes, like the Brady counterpart, sinus tachycardia may actually be inappropriate. What is inappropriate? Inappropriate means we are not expecting such sorts of high rate in a patient in that condition, but the rate is disproportionately high. Uh, in one study, less than 5% cases of sinus tachycardia may actually be inappropriate. Look at this. This is a very interesting uh, tracing. Uh, at first sight, this looks like a sinus tachycardia, but some sorts of sinus tachycardia may actually not be sinus tachycardia, they are actually sinus tachycardia mimics, like the case here. The dictum is whenever you are encountering a, a patient with apparent sinus tachycardia with ventricular rate exactly 150 or 100 or 75, always think of dealing with the case of atrial flutter. As is the case here, this is the example of atrial flutter with twist one AV conduction. Just if you are forgetting the uh, uh, R waves and just looking at the baseline here in the lead two, the baseline looks like the sawtooth appearance. So this should be kept in mind in all the practicing cardiologists throughout the life. Let us see here, this sinus tachycardia is having at the same time first degree AV block. Another very common may be even encountered in 50% of the patient with sinus node dysfunction is atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is a commonly encountered tachyarrhythmia in patients with sinus node dysfunction. No definitive way to distinguish between atrial fibrillation associated with sinus node dysfunction and atrial fibrillation with normal sinus function. But I am giving you a clue that whenever you are dealing with atrial fibrillation with unduly slow ventricular rate in absence of rate limiting blocks like beta blocker, digitalis, or calcium channel blockers, always think of presence of sinus node dysfunction unless proved otherwise. Let us see the example here. This is the uh, ECG tracing of a 61 year old male who presented with atrial fibrillation and the maximum recorded pause was 2.72 seconds. 
And here you are seeing that the rhythm is atrial fibrillation and there are long pauses. Such sorts of long pauses may indicate presence of underlying sinus node dysfunction. So you should always keep in mind that slow atrial AF may be a feature of sinus node dysfunction. Let us see another example. This is the story of a 61-year-old male with atrial fibrillation. You will all agree with me that this is the rhythm strip of atrial fibrillation. And here, the same patient is having slowing down of the ventricular rate, as is the case here. And the longest recorded pause was 2.9 seconds. So probably with the previous discussion, this is now clear that we are probably dealing with the case of sinus node dysfunction. Another example, this is the story of a 40-year-old male who presented with syncope. What is the rhythm here? I think you all agree that this is a case of atrial flutter, not fibrillation. This is a case of atrial flutter with variable block, as is the appearance of the baseline characterized by sawtooth appearance. And the same patient in another time of the day, here there are significant long pauses. And you will see that there is junctional bits and also the retrograde P here. So these are the examples of cases of synatinous dysfunction where not atrial fibrillation, rather atrial flutter may be accompanied by bradyarrhythmias. Now, another very funny and interesting entity in the life history or the natural course of uh, sinus node dysfunction. This is also quite common, may be encountered in half the patient of sinus node dysfunction. Uh, and one thinking is that it may pre precede the development of final outcome of the sinus node dysfunction, that is chronic atrial fibrillation. Periods of bradyarrhythmia are interrupted by paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias. And this is the very characteristic feature of tachybrady syndrome. And whenever in our clinical practice we encounter tachybrady syndrome, virtually always we are encountering uh, sinus node dysfunction. What are the commonly encountered bradyarrhythmias in this setting? The commonly encountered bradyarrhythmias are sinus bradycardia with slow supraventricular ectopic rhythms or slow supraventricular ectopic rhythms, or we can encounter tachyarrhythmias in the form of atrial fibrillation or flutter, flutter, but less commonly we can see ectopic atrial or junctional tachycardias. And whenever the patient is having tachy or brady episodes, he or she present with symptoms of dizziness, syncope, near syncope, or palpitation. Look at this. This is an example of tachy brady syndrome. Here, the tachycardia is suddenly followed by a long pause. Whenever a bout of tachycardia is suddenly followed by such sorts of long pause, this is a characteristic feature of sinus node dysfunction. And after the long pause, there is slowing down of the rhythm and probably there is a sinus bradycardia. Now a real world ex uh, example, a 52 year old male with palpitation and dizziness. Here we all agree that we are dealing with a case of supraventricular arrhythmia, maybe atrial flutter with variable block, and then there is sinus bradycardia. The same patient in another part of the day, there are just uh, probably supraventricular tachycardia, maybe atrial flutter with twist to an epic conduction. And the same patient in another occasion has presented with long pauses, here long pauses, and also sinus pericardia. Now I am going to tell about the story of a 70-year-old retired school teacher who is right, right now admitted in NICVD in our unit. Uh, he is dormotensive and non-diabetic. Uh, he had the history of inferior myocardial infarction followed by PCI in 2018 for DVD. Just he presented with three months history of repeated syncope and presyncope, and each time lasting for one to two minutes with spontaneous recovery. Look at this. This is the very typical complaints and uh, presentation of sinus node dysfunction. With these complaints, he presented to a neurologist. And what the neurologist did, the experienced and competent neurologist rightly 
thought of presence of cardiac causes and he advised eeg and mri of the brain with mra after cardiac evaluation mind it i noted uh, that he uh, wrote down on his prescription after cardiac evaluation and what was the echo findings the patient was certainly having regional wall motion abnormality accompanied by moderate mitral regurgitation and the left ventricular ejection fraction was in the moderate range 40% this is the example i just uh, uh, encountered for the first time in my life that in bangladesh i i i saw a seven day ecg monitoring report and this report belongs to the uh, elderly man i just uh, going to discuss here the rhythm strip of this patient look at this uh, this is sinus bradycardia and in the lower part this sinus bradycardia is rather extreme extreme sinus bradycardia but look at this this is sinus bradycardia this is not junctional bradycardia this is not complete heart block here the av dissociation av association is maintained so this is an example of extreme sinus bradycardia the same patient here we all agree that you all agree that this patient is having episodes of atrial fibrillation and the rate is not very slow and here the atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate has been followed by a very long pause very long pause followed by appearance of a supraventricular beat followed by a ventricular beat and then appearance of sinus bradycardia probably the patient has got such sorts of dizziness syncope and presyncope during the uh, 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 during the long pauses and then whenever the tachyarrhythmia or the normal bradi uh, sinus rhythm may be in the form of bradycardia returns he or she becomes normal now some few words regarding asystolic pause asystolic pauses may even be encountered in young or otherwise healthy person and this may be absolutely normal and this may be just due to vagal surge related to neurocardiogenic syncope or even maybe normal sleep and asystolic response after cardioversion mind it after cardioversion after a tachycardia in elderly or in presence of heart disease is often due to sinus node dysfunction the dictum is that whenever in an apparently healthy person you are performing cardioversion for a tachyarrhythmia these should rapidly be followed by appearance of uh, sinus rhythm because of the healthy sinus node but whenever the sinus node itself is uh, sick this may not be able to fire timely let us have another example this is the story of a 55 year old lady who presented with bradyarrhythmia and was referred to an icvd for uh, by a cardiologist for ppm implantation and whenever we go through the halter report of this lady this was the picture there was a very long pause and this was accompanied by bradycardia sinus bradycardia most of the times before going to perform pacemaker implantation we carefully evaluated the patient further we looked that we looked at the lady and uh, found, found that this lady was having complaints of episodes of palpitation but no syncope mind it no syncope number 2 she was obese and her bmi was 60 36 kg per square meter and she got snoring recurrent arousal and daytime somnolence we all know that i am talking i am going to talk about see, just uh, 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 tsh is normal and echo showed moderate tr and psp was in the moderate range that is 54 mm mercury i was we advised for polysomnography and who is just disclosed severe obstructive sleep apnea for academic purposes and also to rule out any accompanying uh, coronary artery disease Uh, we did coronary angiogram which was normal and ep study was also done and this was also normal and here you are seeing just the significant tricuspid regurgitation and the trz uh, velocity uh, uh, gave rise to the psp value of 54 mm mercury we all know that significantly obese patient and if actually he or she is a case of obstructive sleep apnea she can present with cord pulmonary as is the case present here the same patient was offered cpap therapy without 
implanting any pacemaker. And to our satisfaction, this lady was uh, completely free of uh, palpitations or complaints or snorting or like these things. And whenever the halter monitoring was repeated, this was the picture of the halter monitor with the same mid-legged lady. So before implanting a pacemaker to a patient with apparent, uh, uh, say, sinus node dysfunction, you have to think of presence of the underlying other abnormalities, and you should rule out this. And one very important entity is obstructive sleep apnea. And this is of academic interest, Vickian syndrome, and whenever Wadud Sar and other teachers just taught us in third year, uh, this was a favorite term. The theme is that eat to live, but don't live to eat. Now, this is not the end of my story. Uh, I have some more thing to present before you. Uh, let us have the story of a 44-year-old lady who presented with heat in the head. Just I encountered this patient in my chamber uh, maybe within one week. This lady was hypertensive, diabetic, and hypothyroid. The cardiologist, who is a practicing cardiologist of Dhaka and an associate professor of a reputed institution, advised her for immediate PPM implantation on the basis of cardiac evaluation. And when I asked, the lady denied any syncope or presyncope. This is the ECG of the lady, and this is not very unusual that this patient is having significant sinus bradycardia and the ventricular rate was 44 per minute. I thought that this may be due to underlying hypothyroidism, but probably this is not the explanation because the lady uh, is on regular thyroxine replacement. Her echo uh, revealed no regional wall motion abnormality and she had just mild mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, and her ejection fraction was quite normal. This is the halter monitor tracing of this lady. And here the first EGV block is accompanied by sinus bradycardia. And here the recording of another time of the day. Probably seeing this source of bradyarrhythmia, that uh, colleague was suggesting her to have pacemaker implantation. Look at this. This patient was having treadmill test. And whenever exercise test was done, she did her uh, exercise uh, uh, up to 8.7 meds and maximum heart rate was 176 per minute. That is the 94% of maximal predicted heart rate for the lady. So this proves that this lady is not having any chronotropic incompetence. And this is the beauty of treadmill test in the setting of suspected six sinus syndrome. You should keep this in your mind throughout the life. And I only asked for one investigation for the lady, and that was a CT coronary angiogram, which excluded any significant coronary artery lesion. So what may be the explanation? I am going back to my patient Salter tracing. Look at this. This lady is having sinus bradycardia and at best first degree block, nothing else. And this, certainly there is sinus bradycardia. But whenever I looked at the markings here, here the speed, paper speed was 25 millimeter per second. And here the paper speed was 50 millimeter per second. And probably this was the explanation for misleading the colleague. So don't treat the halter or the ECG or the investigator, whatever sophisticated it might be. Always uh, think of the underlying uh, explanation and treat the patient never the investigations. One Achilles heel of the uh, halter monitor is presence of significant artifacts, as is the case here. There are so many artifacts that it is very difficult to make a uh, proper diagnosis here. Also, there are significant artifacts, and at first sight, these artifacts may uh, look like presence of non-sustained VT. A recording from a 45-year-old male was at first uh, giving the impression of sinus pause, significant sinus pause, and the auto-interpretation was also 
is that 6.41 seconds. And uh, I am sorry to say that many of the cardiologists actually do not go into the details of the Halter report. And they do not even pay time, pay, pay, take the pains of going through the tracing and the details of the uh, uh, Halter monitor report. They only, they only uh, uh, rely on the, all the computer interpretation and sometimes put a signature below the computer interpretation. Never do this in your lifetime. Otherwise, this may be a blunder. And one blunder in your life may be enough to uh, make help to a patient. Let us have the story of a 58-year-old high official, acting minister of the government right now. And he presented with episodes of syncope and trauma to the head. Mind it, whenever some uh, maybe middle-aged or even young patient presents with syncope or trauma to the head, not due to accident, rather spontaneous trauma, always think of a serious underlying pathology unless proved otherwise. And one important field is cardiology. So we thought of presence of some sorts of cardiac problems and we advised, advised for 48 hours Salter monitor. And this is part of the recording of that high official. Uh, you all agree with me that probably this is a case of atrial fibrillation with satisfactory ventricular rate. The same patient in another time of the day, here sometimes the there are some sinus beats, and here there are some pauses. And probably, maybe in other parts of the day, there may be even longer pauses, and these longer pauses may actually underlying the uh, head trauma of the patient. So don't take anything very lightly. Always be critical and be meticulous and try to find out the explanation. With the words, I like to conclude my a presentation with some take home messages. Sinus node dysfunction is a combination of bradyarrhythmia and symptoms of cardiac insufficiency. Mind it, this is a syndrome, not a symptom or only single entity. Correlation between bradyarrhythmia and syncopes, syn symptoms that is syncope, is a must for diagnosis. Is a must for diagnosis. Otherwise, we will be in trouble. Inappropriate sinus bradycardia sinoatrial pauses and exit blocks are suggestive but not diagnostic in isolation. That is, I am talking about in absence of symptoms or clinical appropriate clinical background. Tachyarrhythmias are common but not infallible. Atrial fibrillation or flutter with very slow ventricular rate suggests sinus node dysfunction in absence of other explanation. I am talking about drugs especially. Escape rhythms with slow rate are also suggestive. With these few words, I am going to uh, uh, welcome you to the world of chaffron flowers I visited in Kashmir. And this is the beautiful flower just from the uh, field with virtually no lips. Thank you all for the patient hearing. Thank you, Manuel. Welcome, sir. Uh, can you stop? You, Dr. Manwar. Dr. Manwar, it was a uh, brilliant yes. presentation as usual. We know that you present very well. And we have got some questions for you. Uh, Manwar, stop. Actually, 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 the questions are for my teachers mainly, not for <laughs> me. <laughs> Dr. Manwar, please stop sharing your screen. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Now we can say you see your face beautifully. Uh, question from Buddhadev Ganguly. Difference between high grade SA block and uh, SA block, that is grade 3 and sinus arrest. Uh, actually, in resting ECG, we cannot make any differentiation between sinus arrest and the third degree SA block. I am uh, probably you are talking about third degree SA block because yes, both yes. will appear as sinus pauses, a long pause in uh, resting 12 bit ECG. For the distinction, we have to rely on electrophysiology. Rafik sir, do you want to make a comment? I, I, I don't think, I think we should forget about first degree, second degree, third degree, heart block in sinus node. Yeah. Um, if I sit down and spend several hours with the timing, I can actually prove when can buy a block. But that is very difficult in real life. That is not possible. So, 
I think what we need to remember is it's a block, two to one or three to one, but be, please be careful. I carefully looked at the ECG that Mono showed with two to one as a block actually was not exactly multiple of the PP interval. Um, so you have to measure it carefully. If it doesn't match, it's not as a block. If it is not multiple long pause, that's sinus arrest. And I just want to keep life simple. Remember sinus arrest, remember two to one as a block or any kind of as a block if it is multiple or sinus bandic arrest. That will be my um, take on it because it's tough to prove it. Even, even in the electrophysiology lab, unless- Excuse me, the sound is okay. very bad. Oh, is my sound bad? Uh, we, are, oh, we, can, we can listen to you very well. Okay, so the other problem is that even in the EP lab, it will be difficult to prove unless I have an electrode inside the sinus node. Because let's say there is a signal generated in the sinus node, it's not coming out. And if I put an electrode next to it, I will not record the signal at all. So even in the EP lab, it will be very, very difficult to prove. But I want to make one point, and I want to congratulate an, a Monwar for one thing, that 55-year-old female with 7.5 second for that night. If you paid attention, Monwar left the time, and that recording was at 2.50 a.m. in the morning. That is very, very important. Even if that pause happened during daytime, I always ask my patient if he was sleeping or awake. And I, I'm, I'm very happy that you did not put a pacemaker in. And, Fantastic. And please remember this. Other thing is that the younger the patient, more resistant we are to put pacemaker. If somebody is 85 year old, we should take it a little lightly. But if somebody is 50, 55 year old, um, we have to be very, very careful. And I, that brings us to the case of Dr. Muskie showed last week, didn't put a pacemaker in, did fine. Patient probably hopefully will do well for many years to come, as long as we keep an eye on the patient. Thank you. Can I make a Regarding the uh, SA node arrest or uh, exit block, ultimate management plan is same. Same, yeah. That's the important thing. Yes, sir. Exactly. That's the important thing. Exactly. And, uh, sir, regarding sir, sir. the lecture of Monwar, I just uh, want to differ in one point. When I was internist, and I was a uh, non-electrophysiology cardi cardi uh, cardiologist. I used to think that sick sinus syndrome and sinus node dysfunction is interchangeable terms. But when I studied the electrophysiology books, I could find that the sick sinus syndrome is a specific term borrowed for the tachycardia bradycardia syndrome. Mostly this tachycardia bradycardia syndrome is atrial fibrillation with first ventricular red, followed by stopping the tachycardia, a long pause, and then bradycardia. During this long pause and bradycardia, the patient develops syncope. Yeah. This is the uh, thing I learned when I came for electrophysiology study. Sir, Ruby, sir. Sir, Ruby, yes. sir can, I, can I ask a question, sir? Yes. Sir, I have seen in some of the books, if the is with a sinus bit, it is likely to be the block. And if it is the non sinus, that is other bit, that is the escape, some other, it may, uh, may most likely to be the uh, arrest. Sir, whether it is, uh, how much it is true, sir, this, this term, that is the, uh, just after the pause, the bit, either whether yeah. it is sinus or the non sinus. If, I, if yes, they, it is sinus, then it's likely to be sinus block. Right. Are the, the question, yeah, the question is that. If the escape bit is sinus, is it as a block? If the escape bit is non-sinus, is it sinus arrest? Right, sir. Is, if it is non-sinus, most likely sinus arrest. But if it is sinus, that does not necessarily mean yeah. it's not sinus arrest. Because you can have, after four seconds, a sinus escape bit. And that will be the, by definition sinus arrest. And if it is multiple of, uh, let's say, three times the preceding P to P interval, then it is as a block. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Right, the sir. other thing is that once somebody develops permanent atrial fibrillation, then the diagnosis of six sinus syndrome does not apply anymore because it's now 
it's gone. It's not permanent. This is a different category of patient. Right. And, and the bradycardia associated in, during AFib is not because of sinus node problem. It is because of the AV conduction problem. So that should be treated as an AV conduction issue rather than uh, sinus node disease because it's already sinus is disease so much that it has been replaced by atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, this was the question of some of the uh, attendees also, is that uh, whether the slow ventricular rate in atrial fibrillation is a, is it a disease of AV node or SA node? So from Rafiq's comment, it is clear that it is more a disease of AV node or the effect of drugs like this. Uh, another important thing the Dr. Jamil Bhai was telling that sick sinus syndrome means atrial fibrillation followed by pause. Uh, is that that does that means that these sinus arrays not only not by... only atrial fibrillation fellows it is tachycardia supraventricular tachycardia followed by pause and mostly this patient mostly are of atrial fibrillation atrial so fibrillation... isolated tachycardia is not sick sinus syndrome no 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 that's sinus node dysfunction yes this is nicely demonstrated by monoa this can okay be. all right so if you uh, let me challenge that theory. Beyond Borg, the tennis player, his heart rate was 38. Will you call him sinus node disease? No, sir. Yes, no. Let's have, uh, he, was he was so six the, Wimbledon champion. Uh, on the other hand, if my heart rate has always been 75, and then two days later, I go to the doctor with dizziness, my heart rate is 40, and I am not taking beta blocker. Something has happened to this. Um, so I think the spectrum, if you look at the original article, this is actually, you know that this was defined. The article, original article came out in 1968 by a female cardiologist from Argentina, and Dr. Feller. And the spectrum is, includes sinus bradycardia, bradycardia, tachycardia, or SA block. Those, all those things are in the, in the group of the sinus node dysfunction. Basically, the sinus node is malfunctioning for whatever reason. And again, we should repeat, sir. Actually, what was the spirit of the monoars lecture? That is, none of the findings are diagnostic. Actually, we have to correlate yes. with the symptoms. Yes. What yes. actually what monoar has stressed uh, repeatedly that is, uh, none of the findings are uh, that is a pause or something else. These are not uh, diagnostics for the sinus node disease. You know, one good thing I'm finding out that uh, how Bangladesh cardiology is evolving. I mean, if you all this discussion that we are having, I mean, I have always been positive about Bangladesh, and I am more so positive now than before, that we are discussing all this issue. This case that Monor presented 7.5 seconds, 10 years ago, probably everybody would have said, put a pacemaker in, but we are not doing it. That's a wonderful thing to do. Thank you all. Another thing is um, this diagnostic test. Electrophysiology was once used to detect sinus node dysfunction, but uh, in during study, if we find no sinus node dysfunction, it doesn't exclude the sinus node dysfunction. Even with normal um, SNRT and other findings during EP study, uh, it does not exclude sinus node dysfunction. So, uh, exactly what Monwar said, none of the tests are diagnostic. You know, but yeah. but the, uh, long loop recording and long uh, ECG monitoring is very important to detect the sinus node dysfunction. Hafiz is not saying anything. He's sitting quiet. Ravi Bhai, yeah, I, I, my I, issue is that this, uh, I go by the patient's sim symptoms yes. more than, yes. more yes. than the, <laughs> if the patient has recurrent syncope or syncope convincing, I go by that more than, than arguing with EP, you know. <laughs> Uh, but if the if we, we have done quite a fair number with loop recorder if the unexplained syncope. But I always see that uh, at the end of the day, Rohit, but I don't know why the EP guys do not do systematic, you know, the EP studies. And, and oh. some will say, okay, we'll do it. Some will say, even after doing it, they cannot come to a conclusion. So I'm kind of very dis discouraged okay. with all the electrophysiology. I go okay. by the symptoms. Okay, so let's say somebody comes, a 40-year-old female with syncope, and EP study showed normal ejection fraction, 
12 dCG is perfectly normal. The diagnostic yield of a positive electrophysiology study will be less than 10%. Yes. yes. So you will not, if you subject this patient to an electrophysiology study, it will be just wasters of time, my time and the patient's time and money. Yes. Second, if the same patient had first degree AV block and left bundle bind block, yep. I can either, if, if this, this patient is 40 year old, so what I will do, I will probably do an EP study to look at the HV interval. On the other hand, if this patient is 75 year old, history of syncope, left bundle, first degree AP block, I may recommend a pacemaker just like that. Yep. I'll say, go ahead and put a pacemaker in. So yes, that's the way it is. But basically, the, basically it's the symptom and the, uh, and the patient. Yes, and the bottom line is that symptom, is, please remember, I think, uh, even with all the technology development, talking to the patient and the clinical symptom and the presentation, there is no alternate to this. And syncope patients are very tricky. What I do, I will sit down with the patient, ask from the last episode, ask them what they were doing. Why are they sitting down, lying down? What happened? Did they have injury? As Monwar mentioned, somebody with injury. And then I'll go for a history that before, at least one or two episodes so that I can get a pattern to it. And I'm very happy that the neurologist did not do the MRI to start with. <laughs> so that, no, that's, that's, you know, that's the development. I mean, this is evolution of medicine. In, even in the United States, if you go to rural United States, you will find physicians doing stupid things right and left, wasting money or doing things because patient had the money to pay. But medicine, no, or I'm medicine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to disagree, Corey. Even in teaching hospitals, sometimes they do MRI. Before, before you see the patients, all done. I mean, yeah. I get so upset with this. Yes. Uh, sometimes right. they do, do things. Well, no, but anyway, that, that was a good discussion. I, I just uh, had to leave, but I, I loved it. Thank you. Thank you, Hafiz. Thank you, Hafiz. So, we go for the next session. Uh, Firoz, uh, one or two questions. Uh, go to the Rehan's question, please, if you please. Uh, one of the question was, can hyperkalemia cause site six sinus node disease dysfunction? Actually, uh, this is one of the extrinsic causes of sinus node dysfunction, but certainly this is reversible cause. So uh, you have to correct the underlying hyperkalemia before doing anything. So Dr. Rehan's question is, P wave is the indicator of atrial depolarization. Why P is used as a marker of sinus node dysfunction? <laughs> because actually sinus node has got two types of cells. One is P cells, that is pacemaker cells, and another one is T cells, that is transitional cells. The pacemaker cells fire and produce impulse, depolarize, and the transitional cells convey the impulse. So uh, I think uh, P waves indicate the activity of the pacemaker cells of the sinus node. So why not P wave? It's a whole big key for the body joy. Exactly. What is atrial stand still? The big atrial stand, atrial stand still actually uh, uh, applies to the applies to the conditions that is the reflexes in which there is uh, uh, firing of the SA node and ultimately there uh, appears some sorts of pacemakers from the lower part of the heart, maybe in the AV node, maybe in the atrium, maybe in the um, other part of the conductional system or even in the ventricle. So during that time, there will be loss of consciousness and whenever the new pacemakers takes over, there will be regain of consciousness. Am I correct, sir? Yeah. Actual standstill means there is no actual activity. But okay. this term, please be careful. So what happens, we can find a patient rarely that there is no actual activity, there is a junctional rhythm at the rate of 40. And some of these patients, you cannot pace the atrium at all. You can put atrial lead, there will be no electrical and there will be no equivalent mechanical activity. It's not possible to identify from outside, it is rare. But as Monor said, actual standstill means there is no actual activity recorded at all. Um, 
sir, sir, can I ask you something? Uh, if a patient on long stick fibrillation would lead to uh, convert it, sometimes it does happen that patients do not produce atrial activity for some time. Yes. Yes. That's so I'll take you in. Just a few days ago, I had a patient. So the cardiologist who did the cardioversion called me in a panic. They did cardioversion with a heart rate of 29 beats per minute, junction. So I went in and put a temporary pacemaker in. And the question was what to do. Patient was on metoprolol 150 milligrams BID, diltiazem CD 120 milligrams daily, and amiodarone for actual fibrillation. So what we did, we just held this medicine 48 hours later patient had heart rate of uh, sinus rate. So basically that's, that's sinus node dysfunction was partially caused by the medication. So remember the reversible causes, one will be medication, one will be electrolyte. The other common cause is hypothyroidism. Yes. Not very uncommon. So that has to be excluded, especially in young people. Sir, can can I, I make a comment to the question? Yes. Can please. I say something? Yeah. Hello, sir. So a couple of things I want to clarify because dealing with the residents and fellows, they sometimes get confusing. So atrial standstill or ventricular standstill. Atrial standstill means the depolarization of the atria you don't see. And ventricular standstill means you see the atrial activity, you don't see any ventricular depolarization. Ventricular standstill. There is another term is atrial stunning. Stunning means that there is no mechanical contraction of the chamber. So for example, after the cardioversion in AFib, you may see P wave, but there is no electrical activity associated with mechanical coupling. So atrial will be stunned. And it, that is one of the theory of atrial stunning or an ideal milieu for thrombus formation. So atrial stand is still, atrial is stunning, Two different things, and another point I wanted to mention for the for the cardioversion purposes, and we call the EP guys later because you know general cardiologists we cardiovert. I would be cautious about cardioverting an elderly patient with so many AV nodal blocking agents on board, and then give like 200 joules, boom, and then you see this bradycardia, and then you panic and you call the EP and uh, temporary wear and in a mess. So you need to be very careful about this group of patients and try to not uh, bombard with three drugs and then bring back to the lab for cardioverting with higher juice. But Hafiz, the practical scenario that one may face that the patient was outside with a rapid ventricular response. Yeah. And the physician had to use that dose. So what I would have done in that patient I would have held the beta blocker the day before at least, and Correct. the catch and fan blocker. I mean, you have to do I have that. done also with this, like I went up with the 50 and graded fashion. Now oh, I've done no. 200. Okay, you don't I disagree. No, I don't do that. Because <laughs> I, I used to be called one shock doctor and still do. If my theory, my theory about cardioversion is, if I need 50 joules, I'll give 150 because I'll be done with one shock. And there is no difference in myocardial stunning. There is no data that if you give higher energy, you will have more myocardial stunning. So no, I, I, I just go with always 360. I, I also use, don't get me wrong, I use Bible as well. You know, you know we are you mean uh, biphasic synchronized. I use Bible yeah. as well. Uh, but I, I don't go one shot. Um, I go, <laughs> I'm chicken on this. No, I, I, that is not, no, I, uh, uh, anyway, so I always use hash shock. I use 50 more than I need and I'm done with one shot. Anyway, mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. I have good anesthesia. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, another question is what is isorhythmic atrioventricular dissociation? And a slow atrial rate in isorhythmic uh, atrioventricular dissociation is it a sinus node dysfunction? Is, <coughs> sorry? What is so? isorhythmic atrioventricular dissociation? Isorhythmic atrioventricular dissociation? Yes. Uh, I think uh, Patar sir can give the answer. 
Atar sir. Atar bhai, uh, unmute. Unmute please. So, please not, not to ask. Rupik sir, please answer the question. Actually, Why did you uh, find this? Can you hear you? Uh, this is a question from one Hello? of the attendees. That is that. isorithmic right. ventricular dissociation. Well, okay, let me let me answer this. So every dissociation means atrium and the ventricle are dissociated from each other. Mm -hmm. And one of the cause, perfect example, is complete heart block. Second will be ventricular tachycardia. But let's say the atrium is beating at a rate of 42 beats per minute. At the same time, junction is beating at 41 beats per minute. What happens? Atrium and the ventricle are dissociated, but they are almost same rate. Yes. So that will be the scenario. But I mean, I, I, I have heard this term after a long, long time. As Obi-Wan Connolly said, I have not seen this for many, many years. Please stay away. Please the book stay away. Says, in, in the Please. book, it says, and people love this term, but in the, you have pointed out a very interesting thing. And sometimes the, I don't know why the residents sometimes get confused. When we say AV dissociation, they always say VT. But in complete outbreak, there is AV dissociation. But the ventricular rate is lower than the atrium. Yeah. In, uh, one thing is that I said it be dissociation. There is active activity, there is ventricular activity. Very nearly similar rate. But they're separate, and it's not sinus nerve disease. It's on the uh, it's every nerve disease. That may be part of sinus nerve disease, but it's every nerve disease. But it can, but it also can happen without any disease because they are just beating close to each other. All right. Uh, so can we go to next session? We can go for the next session. Uh, is the is the presentation just being CG presentation by Rofi Gamet, sir. sir, please. That's why I'm leaving. Okay. Okay, Manuel. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Very good. Uh, review, can you, can you uh, prepare uh, the yes. polling, yeah. polling options? Yes, sir. Give us just a few seconds. We are starting the poll. And, uh, sir, may start the question. We'll start the poll afterwards. Yeah. Give me one yes. second. Let me just Yes, start. sir. Of course. Thank you. So, let me show. I want to um, start with the question. I'm going to show you, and I will take a little bit time on history of ECG. I thought everybody would be interested. I found some very, very interesting things. Uh, so, this is the person who first recorded electrical signal from the heart. He's a British physiologist. And what he recorded, he just showed that you can record electrical activity from the heart. What he did, you think this white line is the ECG? No, this is the apex cardiogram. If you see there is a line between the black and, black and white, that was the early ECG recording. And then he used to take this dog, his dog Jimmy. Jimmy's leg will put in one foot in a saline solution, other foot in a saline solution, connect it to the machine and show that you can record the electrical signal. And then Eindhoven, this is the guy. I mean, I used to think, why is he so famous about ECG? A lot of people have recorded. So what Eindhoven did, he made this machine, which was 600 pound uh, and 600 kilogram in weight. It used to be connected to patient in a hospital 10 miles away by telephone line. And then he recorded this signal. Same like Weiler, and they used to call A, B, C, D. But you see, there is a difference. There is a black and white side. What they used to do on this side, black side, they used to put mercury. And on the white side, they used to put sulfuric acid. And it, the picture came out like this. But this was not good. So what Eindhoven did, he did mathematical extrapolation of the signal. 
and came up with what we call ECG today. That was a direct recording, raw tracing. This is, a, and he called it PQRS. And the question is, why did he call PQRS? There is a guy, mathematician, his name is Descartes. In 17th century, he did sine wave. And he did nomenclature starting from P. And that's why Einthoven is thought to follow that. And other reason he did PQRS, that you can put numbers before and after, like after the T wave, they put U. And you can put other waves also. So that's the history of this nomenclature. And then people who are not very impressed, then what he did, he did carotid arteriogram and ECG. That's when people believed him that, yes, it is true. This is true electrical activity of the heart. So this is a little bit of history. It's very interesting, fascinating story. So I'm going to start with this ECG today. Hebrew poll, please. Yes, sir. We started, sir. This is the ECG. In that 30 seconds, sir. Uh, yes. 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 I hope 100% is right on this ECG. 97% uh, says this C, 3% says D, but only 28% right. of the attendees voted down. Only 8%? 28%. 28% voted, but still, I, I mean, we are good. So this is good that this is the normal ECG. Please put this picture in your brain. It's like looking at your brother that once you see your brother, you don't have to argue why it is your brother. The so normal ECG should be imprinted in our brain. This is the normal ECG. Thank you. Why aren't everybody else answering? We need to have more participation. So this ECG. This is a 57 year old male. Um, no symptom at all. I want everybody to answer. Please, it's fine to make mistakes. Thirty seconds is over, sir. Uh, Forty-eight percent says it's D, complete heart block. Twenty-nine percent says it is C, and nineteen percent says it is uh, A. That is junction rhythm. What percent um, answered? Uh, it was it was again twenty, twenty to thirty percent. Okay. Uh, any any comment from any of our panelists on this ECG? This uh, is tricky, ECG. Do you want to make a comment, Asa? Uh, so uh, I will start. I mean, majority said complete heart block. Yes, sir. If it was complete heart block, you would expect the RR interval to be regular. Yes, sir. Because either it's a junctional escape beat or a ventricular escape beat, most of the time it will be I'm 90, more than 90% of that. It is not regular. So even though majority of you answered complete hard block, this is not complete hard block. So it has to be one or the other. Is it junctional rhythm? If it is junctional rhythm, again, I would expect it to be regular and I would expect there will be no P wave at all. But if you look here, there is a P wave and maybe it is conducted. There is a P wave here. Maybe it is conducted with long R. So most of you may have started in the beginning. When you get confused, go somewhere where you can see it. So there is a P QRS and there is a P possible QRS and there is a P possible QRS conducted from this. And then I will go backward. Okay, now let's look at it. Let's look at it. 
So if I say P, Q, R, S, P, Q, R, S, prolongation, P, and now if I go backward, there is a P wave here, which did not conduct. And there is a possible P wave with a long PR, PR, there is a P conducted. So basically, there is a long PR, non-conducted, next P wave, short PR. This was Wenke by AV block. And this patient had absolutely, say, an, another time, it is 17 September 2020, a little bit earlier done ECG, you can see it better now. You can see that the P wave QRS complex, P wave with long PR QRS, there is a P wave not conducted, again short. So this is very typically, if I have shown this one, all of you would have answered. But please remember one point that, that it, we should not have called it complete heart block because the underlying rhythm was there is a degree of irregularity. And the, so this is another patient. Time is over, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Fifty-eight percent says it is sinus tachycardia with first degree heart problem. Okay. And Fantastic. So, three percent said actual fibrillation. Yes, sir. And for those three percent, I have one qu question: Is the RR interval is extremely regular? In actual fibrillation, you do not expect that. So. I would have been extremely very, 3% is a good number, but this, because of the presence of regular RR interval, one arrhythmia it is not, is not actual fibrillation, but it can be any one of those others. And first degree AV block, yes, if somebody say junctional tachycardia, I would have accepted it, actual flutter, if it was flutter, I have to find a P wave. So if I see, let's say lead V2, I can see two wave and I consider one of them as a flutter wave. And then this another flutter, then I should have expected another flutter somewhere in here, which is not present. So this is not a actual flutter. So the most likely, then I will narrow down to junctional tachycardia and sinus tachycardia. I would have accepted both of those diagnoses. So even an expert with, from this simple ECG, can, I don't think they will be able to distinguish between these two. So this patient, when we, the rate slowed down a little bit, you can see that the P wave is now coming out. Patient has marked first degree AV block. So please remember when patient at first, and in lead two, three AVF, you can see a positive P wave. And then the same patient at a five, much slower rate, you can see the P wave clearly. So this was first degree AV block. This is a common problem. If this rate went to 130, then you won't be able to distinguish between it and SVT. Remember the difference will be that if you observe the patient, if there is a variation in heart rate from minute to minute. Five minutes later, it was 130, and then five minutes earlier at 125, that's most likely sinus tachycardia. If it were actual flutter SVT, it will be solid in one place. So this is an interesting patient, and this I would like our panelists to also help us. This was a patient that came to see me in the clinic patient had a dual chamber pacemaker in place with AVD delay programmed 180 bits, 80 millisecond. And this was the ECG with a heart rate of 97 bits per minute. And I have the choices. What are the, what is the answer? So, sir, uh, forty-three percent says it is uh, four sinus freedom with first degree AV block, normal pacemaker function, 
and 39% says malfunctioning is placement. That is number three. Yeah. Sure. So I'm happy that nobody said actual flutter. I mean, yes, it can be a junctional rhythm because I cannot see a P wave before keyword is here. But if I imagine a P wave, there is a P wave here. So the question is, why isn't it pacing? The pacemaker is programmed at a rate of every delay of 180 millisecond. It should have paced here. Why isn't it pacing here? Our panelist needs to help us with this. Atahar, uh, what do you think? <laughs> So the question was, is the pacemaker malfunctioning? So I mean, uh, malfunctioning. The HL lead is not uh, having connection, uh, connecting the HL wall, so it's not. Okay. So HL lead is not sensing, right? Yes, sir. It looks like it. Or there okay. may be loose connection at the uh, um, battery level. Sure. So this is what I also thought. Maybe it's not. So what I did, I did the timing. So, this post-ventricular actual refractory period is set at 325 milliseconds. And this is what it is. You see the P wave now is in the refractory period. Yes, sir. So what happened? Because this, this is not a problem we encounter normally. This patient has marked first degree AB block. And for whatever reason, P wave fell within the refractory period. So pacemaker did not see the P wave and it just didn't pace. And then, this is the second ECG, it's a slower rate. You see that P wave is just coming out now. And what we did that we reprogrammed the post-ventricular actual refractory period to 225 milliseconds. And now you can see it's pacing normally. So it was a basically a normally functioning page maker, just one programming issue that happened. Pretty unusual, just one I found in many years. Thank you all. So this is another ECG. I want more than 28% to answer. Please do answer. This will help you. I mean, answering questions is a good thing. Um, you commit yourself, either you find yourself that you are right, or you will remember that you are not right and you will, you will learn. So that's both ways it is a learning process and that's what we are trying to do to all of us. I mean, look at all our faculty, we are having discussion. Sometimes we are correct, sometimes we are not. Sometimes we just don't know. That's fine. So uh, only 17% voted for the answer, answered the question. 81% says it is C, sinus rhythm with alternating RBB-LBB with movie type yes. to the Good. Okay, so I'm happy that nobody said actual fibrillation because even though there is an irregularity, there is a pattern to it. So what I have here, if I look at lead V1, there is PR interval, there is right bundle bunch block, there's a P wave which did not conduct, there is a P wave with the right bundle, and then there is a P wave and there is a white complex. Different. And the question is, is it a ventricular premature beat? I should have given that, yeah, a supraventricular premature beat, aberration or ventricular premature beat. So I thought, and one can argue both ways. One can say, well, it is not um, a, a left bundle, it's a premature, ventricular premature beat. But look at this. I expanded the V1 and V2. If you remember our discussion from diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia, when there is left bundle morphology, if the initial R is less than one box, that's left bundle. If the initial R is wider than one box, then it's the ventricular premature beat or ventricular rhythm. So clearly, absolutely. Thank you very much. So it's two to one heart block, and then we have some conduction uh, alternating right and left bundle branch back. This is patient, I mean, it's both bundle branches are diseased. Sir, 
yeah the previous uh i get that so look at the lead to rhythm stream the pr yeah. interval between before the rd morphology and also the lb morphology pr interval is same that means it's yeah. a sinus bit conducted but one is having rbp one is having lb morphology yes but for the argument sake somebody can say well just a pvc at the same time but absolutely right this it is very unlikely that the consecutive intervals will have the same interval there is yeah. no variation yeah. absolutely thanks thank you sir sir i have a question right. sir. yeah the previous sir so actually in v1 sir the first bit yeah. sir v1 the first bit second bit and the third bit was uh, actually what we are discussing about the lbb or the pvc sir yeah. is it earlier than the expected time sir the the left bundle bit yes little bit tiny bit early and that may explain why it did not conduct through the right bundle probably right bundle has a little bit longer refractory period um than uh, sorry right and left difference very this is conductivity okay this one So 48% says it is sinus rhythm with twist to one, uh, twist to one AV block, sir. And 24%. Yeah. Go ahead. And 24% and says it is complete heart rate. Okay. And then 26% and, and sinus rhythm. First degree heart rate. Sinus yeah. body okay. cardiac, first degree heart rate. Okay. Sure. So, I mean, these are all are the choices. Junction body cardiac probably is not an answer because there is a P wave before each keyword is complex. So let's look in the bottom strip. I have lead to P wave followed by QRS, prolonged PR, and PR interval looks same. So it is possible that this is sinus bradycardia with first degree AP block. And whenever I see something like this, 37, 40 bits, I always try to see if there is another one somewhere. And if you look at lead V1, there is a distortion of the end of the T wave. And Thank that you. is present in lead two also. So it is the second P wave is buried here. And this is what it's looking like, that if you look at, I put the P wave and the P2P interval is 800 millisecond and R2R interval is 1600 millisecond, exactly double. So that is, association two to one in complete hard block it will be totally different there will be no relation between pap interval and rr interval so this is two to one hard block same patient next day goes into complete hard break we can see it now that let's see if i have uh, yeah so this this time now there is no dis um, relationship between p and qrs complex the next day he, she goes into complete hard block this is the 89 year old female a, a couple of more ECGs. um this is the same patient next day. I, you don't have to answer, goes into complete heart block. As you can see, there is a P wave here, P wave here. I'm marking possible P wave, P wave. And if you look at the P to P interval, 660 millisecond, RR interval is 1600. There is no relation. It's not multiple of the P to P interval. So that is complete dissociation. This is an ECG actually, Mohoshin sent me just today. One of his patients, the 70 year old male with history of dizziness and heart rate is 53. So what is this ECG? I'm expecting Rafik bhai 
I'm expecting 70 plus. Uh, 70% good, okay. <laughs> this is related to Monwar's lecture and some uh, some other issues plus something else. So 41, 42, it's ectopic atrial rhythm with first degree AV block. Okay. And 20, uh, 28% says it's junctional rhythm, 18% sinus bradycardia with first degree AV block. Okay, okay. So, one question is, remember that we talked about P wave, that yes, there is a P wave here, but the P wave is inverted in two, three AVF. So that takes out sinus rhythm. So it is either a junctional rhythm or a typical actual rhythm with for it. If it is junctional rhythm, that means this is the junctional rhythm, and this is a retrograde P wave. And one can say, can it be so late? Yeah, it's possible. If you can get 400 millisecond PR interval, you can get 400 millisecond RP interval also, or ectopic atrial rhythm with first degree AV block. The answer is not very simple in this case because the PR is so prolonged. So what I did, what do you think, any panelist? Well, what is the answer? Sir, actually, uh, My question is, is it junctional rhythm with retrograde P wave or is it an ectopic atrial rhythm with anti-grade conduction? Sir, number four is more consistent, sir. Why is that? Sir, it's because, sir, RP interval possible, but yes. it is extremely unlikely in case of the junctional rhythm. Possible, okay. sir. Really possible, yes. but extremely unlikely. Then yes. the P rate, the P is clearly inverted in lead two, and the P rate is consistent with the atrial rhythm. That is the yeah. intrinsic yeah, sure. activity. So what we look at, who is the driver? Is the P driver or the QRL driver? And we use this term actually in electrophysics. We need to identify the driver. Sometimes it is very difficult. And we try to see relation. So what I did, I marked it. This R to R interval, look at this, 1,150, 1,161, and look at P to P interval. P to P is 1,160, R to R, which follows 1,150, close, 1,160, 1,160, 1,150, 1,150. That means this P wave is driving this. This P wave is driving this. So it could have been the other way around, but as Athar said, it is difficult to see retrograde that long, but sometimes it can happen. Like, you know, in a typical AVN RT, you see a long RP interval, it's possible. So there is another ECG on the same patient. If you get uh, the atrophy, uh, then what happens in this If case. you get atrophy, oh yeah, it, the, it can improve. The conduction can improve, especially the, if, it is, if you give atropine, then you, it will help us with the uh, diagnosis. Now, this is the same patient, another ECG. What happens? There is a QRS, there is this P wave, and then there is a QRS. Now there is no more P wave, it is just junctional rhythm. But I think there is a P wave here, which is the retrograde P wave. Because why it is P wave? Look at AVF, there is negative here, it is absent here. So that pulls in with our earlier diagnosis that it was a typic atrial rhythm. This is a classic six sinus syndrome patient. There is no sinus activity. There is a typic atrial activity, which is bradycardic. And I put the timers here that RR interval 1460, 1470, 1400. This one is a little short. I didn't measure this because there is a difference. 1480. So it's, it's a junctional escape beat, and there's a one or two P wave. So that fits in with our earlier diagnosis that this was an ectopic atrial rhythm with anti grade conduction down there, as Athar pointed out. And um, so this is a, a typical six sinus syndrome patient and, and no sinus activity at all. Thank you. I think we'll stop here. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we are going for our next last session, ECG of the week. Athar, sir, have you got the ECG or I, I, can, I can share it for you? No, you, you can share. OK, sir.
Is that this is the ECC of the week, sir? If you just describe it, the two years officer admitted in private hospital for chest pain evaluation on 23-9-2020. CG was normal. ECG heart rate 48 per minute. Was bifascicular block discharged with theophylline and propenthylene. So this is the ECG and interpretation rate 48 per beats per minute. Rhythm sinus rhythm with junctional escape. QRS and axis RBB with left anterior fascicular block. PR interval 140 millisecond, QRS 130 millisecond, QT 410 millisecond. ST segment was normal, QIV inversion in 3 B1 uh, to V3. Diagnosis sinus bradycardia with occasional junction, junctional escape with right bundle bus block with left anterior fascicular block. This is the CD again. This is the sinus beats, junctional beats. Again, sinus bit and sinus bit. This is the right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block. Uh, history of two episodes of simple. One is 2003 and another one is 2008. Non-diabetic, normotensive. First pass out in between two games of badminton match, 2003. Second pass out in toilet, 2008. ECG in 2010. Heart rate 47, RBB with LHFB. 2014, sinus rate, heart rate uh, 50, RBB with left anterior fascicular block. Eco normal, CSD was normal in 2006. ETT in 2015, 10 minutes, heart rate 150 per minute, 86% of the target heart rate. And 2018, 10 minutes, heart rate 148, 85% of the target heart rate. This was the first ECG in 2010. This is the electrophysiological study. The HB interval was 39 millisecond. A view in cover at 290 millisecond. So the final assessment, basic intervals normal, sinus node function normal, atrioventricular conduction normal, and recommendation was clinical follow-up. Does he need further workup? Should we implant pacemaker or follow up? Perfect, sir. Your opinion, please. Anybody else? I'll, I'll talk last. I think, uh, sir, uh, loop recording would be good for this patient evaluation. As because the syncopies are infrequent, not too frequent. Okay. So I, this is an interesting patient. I'll tell you why. First of all, patient goes to the hospital with chest pain, bradycardia, and discharged home on theophylline and propanthaline. <clears throat> this patient's last syncope was in 2008. That is 12 years ago. Any modality of treatment, you will have to wait for 12 years before you tell the patient that you are free of, and this time again, he did not have any more syncope. So you don't know how long you will have to wait. If we put a loop recorder in this patient, then again, this patient has been symptom free for 12 years. So why are we using theophylline and propanthaline? What is the goal of this treatment? I don't understand. Number one. Number two. Somebody with chest pain, you don't want to use any medicine to increase the heart rate. Rather, you will be using beta blocker to lower the heart rate. So that's one thing. I mean, there, we, we never use any medicine. There are some medicine being developed in the 80s to increase heart rate. And one of this medicine was called Zemoterol. And that medicine increased mortality. So nobody ever used, tried to develop any other medicine. This patient had no syncope for 12 years. He had an EP study, which was normal. 
It has right bundle, left anterior fascicular block, normal PR, and it will just clinically follow this patient, do nothing, absolutely nothing for this patient. Am I permitted to have a comment, sir? Yes, go ahead. Uh, is there any need to uh, thyroid function evaluation? It has done. Patient. Was, was, it, was it here? It, it was normal. It was normal. Thyroid was normal. Thank you, sir. Sir, in American College of Cardiology, guidelines for bradycardia, they have recommended for this theophylline drug. Is it practiced? by you or other experts well we people will laugh here if we if i use theophylline i mean what is the purpose i mean what am i trying to achieve in this particular patient? i mean this person is a police officer he plays tennis regularly he has no limitation of his activity at all now if i want to use Let's say for short term period, somebody has some infection or something and radical, I want to use Theophylline for short period, it's fine. But the question is, what is the goal of the treatment? Is it for the physician to feel happy or the patient to feel happy? So that is the question that I have. Sir, I have a question about PPG, sir. Yeah. Sir, motion is here. Sir, sir the, the ECG of the screen, sir. Yes. The, Sir, sir, just please look at the lead two, sir. The first bit is sinus, second bit is sinus, but the third bit is not sinus, sir. Okay. Again, the also. Yes, you know that we talked about isorhythmic dissociation. It's like that. Look at the beginning of the QRS complex in lead two. There is a P wave was just coming out and the junctional bit at the same time. Same with the next bit. There is the initial part. There is a P wave. So there is a competing between sinus and the junction. And this is a perfect example of isorhythmic AV dissociation. And, and the look at the next video. Sir, very suggestive of the sinus to disease at this patient. That's because this patient has got the syncope. Normal EP study does not exclude the sinus to disease, sir. Of course not. But this patient's syncope was in 2008. That was 12 years ago. 12 ah. years. If this patient came to me with syncope now, a 52-year-old, even with this heart rate, I would put a loop recorder in to prove the relation between his syncope and bradycardia before I put a pacemaker in this person. Moshin, do you have the sinus node recovery time in this case? Yes, sir. So, Dekhan, sir, slide as a sir. Next slide as a correct time. If you start for it, but but again to the point that if sinus node recovery time is abnormal that is significant but sinus node recovery time normal doesn't mean anything i mean jamil mentioned that point earlier that ep study if sinus node function abnormal that is very normal. specific but negative doesn't mean much at all but this patient actually Example of beyond will suffice. Yes. Sir, can it be an example of the paroxysmal AV block as because it is difficult to establish by even in the EP study and cannot be oh. as because this patient has got the fascicular block, escape rhythm, and the two syncope. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. I'll, I'll tell you what I would have done. Okay. His first syncope was in 2003. Second syncope, 2008. That's five years. And then the circumstances was after playing one set of tennis, he stood and he passed out, which can be very much vagal. Second one was in the toilet, which again can be suggestive. If you put a loop recorder in this patient, in between the loop recorder, the longest life of loop recorder is three years. But on the other hand, if this patient had another syncope recently, I'll put a loop recorder in, but I will not automatically put a pacemaker in this patient without a proof of a heart block. Absolutely not. Is there a need for antihistamic therapy regarding antihistamic therapy as become patient having chest pain? Or is normal? 
Quadrate is normal. C is Sir, normal. His coronary angiogram came back normal. And EGT was probably also normal in 2015 yeah. and 2018. Yes. So even not a microvascular angina at all. You see, my professor Golamala Choudhury, my surgery professor, used to say there are 150 causes of abdominal pain and peptic ulcer is one of them. <laughs> Likewise, there are many causes of chest pain. <laughs> and coronary artery disease is one of them. I mean, it can be esophageal spasm because esophageal spasm yes, looks... Sir, like, could it be you know, a situational syncope or post-exertional syncope, sir? Uh, it, exactly, it is possible. It That's is. what I'm saying that this thing happened under very circumstance, post exertional you can have um, it immediately after. You know, that's why the, when the sports people, they run, they don't stop immediately. Because if they suddenly stop, they may pass out because their blood pressure will drop. And that's why after long run, sprinters, they don't stop. They, they continue for a few minutes. Uh, only the sprinters will stop. But if somebody runs 5,000 meters, they will not stop. They will keep running uh, and cool down and then stop suddenly. Uh, sir, maybe due to vasodilatation for, for uh, excessive exertion or due to postural syncope, sir? Sure. For two... Yes. Yes. But the bottom line is that this patient at this point does not need any therapy for this bradycardia. That's and, true, uh, Yeah, and uh, Monor pointed it out. Mean, gap in the syncope. Exactly. Also, remember one thing, few more things that this person is a police officer, 52-year-old. You have to be very, very careful before you put a pacemaker because that may impact his livelihood. A, a, a young female, 20-year-old, not married, or 30-year-old, not married, a young female. Before you put a device, you do a surgery, you have to be very, very careful that my diagnosis is really, really, I mean, in the modality of the surgery is absolutely, absolutely necessary. And the same situation happens in an 85-year-old. Male or female, doesn't matter. We will be a little bit more relaxed uh, because of two reasons. Age and the likelihood of disease is much higher in those patients. Sir, although all the tests are done, again, whether we can repeat the ETT to see the conduction, sir? Is there any role, sir? Oh, at this point, there is no need for work up of the syncope because his syncope was 12 years ago. We don't have to do anything at all. And that this guy, he plays tennis regularly. Yes, sir, what is the role he of uh, tilt table test, sir? Uh, the uh, question is, what is the role of tilt table test? Uh, for this patient today, there is no role. However, when the patient initially had syncope, a no, tilt table test Not for have... this patient, sir. Yeah. No. This patient, when he had syncope in 2008, after EP study, everything became negative. You could have done a tilt table test to prove your point. The problem is that it is very difficult to act on the tilt table test um, result. There is not many modality of treatment for this, except very rarely I have found patients with syncope and asystole. Syncope and asystole. I had one patient who had asystole of 30 seconds um, on tilt table. And, but we did not put a pacemaker in because we did not know why the real life same thing happening. So we put loop recorder in those patients to, to correlate that symptom. And if they show that every time they pass out, they have long pause, then we'll put a pacemaker in. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Uh, I think we are at the end of our session. It's 11.10 yep. at night. Uh, some quick comments. Professor Arun Maski, have got any, any comment or there's no comment. I'm enjoying these lectures. And <laughs> <True>. All my <laughs> uh, residents here in Nepal have joined. I've asked all the cup, uh, DM residents from different institutions, from Kathmandu, uh, Pokhara, and every all places. They are joining. They are enjoying it. I myself is learning a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, this Thank is the uh, study group, Rafik sir, and all the speakers and panelists for a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Atharali, sir. Yeah, Kanis, Fatima, Monoa, yeah, Firoz. Uh, she left us, Kanis, Fatima. Khalid Bhai is here, at Chultir Mishkata. Khalid Kuzjavan, Khalid Kuzjavan. Khalid Kuzjavan is not there. Khalid Martin, sir, are you with us? Khalid Martin. 
yes sir your comment yes sir yes sir yeah comments actually about... actually putting a pacemaker is a really it is a difficult decision i am very much scared about putting a pacemaker in a patient who is likely to come back to me with the same, same symptoms you. after putting a pacemaker right, right. i i am ready to it is it is like the uh, exempting a patient from death sentence uh, without a, 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 a proof i am ready to let go uh, a patient with a symptom but if a patient after a putting a pacemaker come back to me i will definitely think my initial decision was a wrong one uh, or because this patient will have no solace myself and the patient after putting a pacemaker if the patient is coming with the same symptoms to me and uh, regarding this police officer the traditional teaching is if a patient with a bifascicular block with a syncope uh, it is a, you need to put a pacemaker because if the patient is in a high risk profession it's a professional aspect has to be taken into consideration but uh, as rafiq sir has said that this is as this is infrequently occurring arrhythmia or symptom i think it warrants special second but in in our country i think uh, 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 at least 90% of our cardiologist out of 100 will recommend a pacemaker for for this type of symptoms actually because of the underlying bifascicular block it is a symptomatic bifascicular block in a high risk professional can it be an airline pilot or some someone else so we we, we uh, need to think again uh, uh, regarding this group of patient so i think the putting a, a the decision of a pacemaker is a really 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 difficult one uh, so it, it is a really eye opener for us and uh, i think the misuse of pacemaker will be uh, prevented by this type of discussions and the, uh, they will be kind to the pockets of our patients thank you very much and thank dr mosin because he has sent the uh, example that was very thank nice. you mosin bhai you have got any comment no sir yeah. how did you manage the patient it was definitely scary with this syncopies how did you manage the patient He was very much confident. As I, uh, he did every day, every year he did ETT and heart rate goes up, and he's very much confident. Because the, that is a, a important thing for the patient and his attendants. Once up, once they have got a syncope, they become scared. Yeah, I think time was favorable for this patient, right? The last syncope eight years ago. You can always say if it happens, they can come back. Otherwise, you are good for now. No, it was twelve years ago. Twelve years ago, exactly. Even better. Yeah. Doctor Shaila, are you with us? Doctor Shaila. Doctor Shaila, no be. Mukadda sir, sir, Sadi. No. Sadi. Sadi, bhai, we missed you a few days ago when your receipt was shown, but we could not connect you. Are you here now? Sadiq bhai for from today's discussion are we going to stop the theo filing for the patient ah, yes this is the yes. Yes. yes thank you thank you yes what about bhai what about you just conclude yes sir i think uh, the conclusion has been already drawn this type of lecture and discussion open discussion frank discussion will actually boost our confidence give us insight Why to put a pacemaker in a situation when the guidelines are not very clear? You put a pacemaker in a symptomatic patient with complete heart block or a bifascicular block with clear cut symptoms. That's all right. But this type of patient, they need some discussion discussion amongst ourselves. And to this presentation, to this input by Dr. Rafiq sir, yes, it has give us the moral boost. of doing the right thing for the proper patient thank you everybody thank you sir thank you uh, we can do this session atha sir no 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 you just conclude the session thanks everybody thank you everybody thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much sir assalamu alaikum thank you everybody thank you assalamu alaikum
Thank you, Mohsin, for your nice demonstration, actually. Uh, without